Hello everybody, welcome back to Psych Saints. My name is Prescott and I'm here at Succinct Psychology and we're going to keep on keeping on with uh, going through the Psychology 2E OpenStax online textbook. Today we're going to start Chapter 7, Thinking and Intelligence. And so without further ado, let's get going. So starting off, we have Cognitive Psychology. So cognition, most simply, is thinking. And it encompasses the processes associated with perception, knowledge, problem solving, judgment, language, and memory. So down here we have a figure of the 19th century girl with a book by Jose Ferraz, De Almedia Jr. here. Um, you know, just some pictures of art, you know, some of my thinking, uh, using their knowledge. Nice little figure there. So continuing, cognition. So we have another figure here. So sens sensations and information are received by our brains filtered through emotions and memories and processed to become thoughts. So here we have, you know, informations and sen information and sensations go in, become emotions and memories, which become thoughts. Thoughts lead back into emotions and memories, because when you're thinking about something, you know, it can cause like an emotional reaction, you know, thinking about something that makes you really happy or sad or mad. And therefore thoughts lead into your behavior. So it's a nice chain here that gets you to your behavior, how you act, what you do during your day. So next we have concepts and prototypes. So how does the brain organize information? So first we have concepts, which are categories of linguistic information, images, ideas, or memories. They're used to see relationships among different elements of experience and can be complex and abstract. Uh, for example, the idea of justice, it's an abstract concept. You know, there's no concrete uh, definition of like what justice is. It can vary from person to person. Um, or concrete, which is, you know, okay, there are types of birds. You know, you have falcons and hawks and eagles. There's no abstractness there. You know, what, if it's blue jay, it's a blue jay. You don't have to think about it. So next you have prototype, which is the best example or representation of a concept. So, for example, Mahatma Gandhi could be a prototype for the category of civil disobedience. So here in 1930, Mohandas Gandhi led a group in peaceful protest against a British tax on salt in India. So he's the best example or representation of the concept. He's the prototype of civil disobedience. Next, we have natural and artificial concepts. So natural concepts are created naturally through either direct or indirect experience. Uh, for example, our concept of snow. Then we have artificial concepts, which are defined by a specific set of characteristics, for example, properties of geometric shapes, so squares, triangles, etc. So, you know, here you have your natural concept, snow, that's just natural, snow happens. And then artificial is you have a large sphere here, pyramid in the background, that's artificial, that's something we made and designed. So schemata, so a schema is a mental construct consisting of a collection of related concepts. When a schema is activated, we automatically make assumptions about the person slash object slash situation. Uh, so a role schema makes assumptions about how individuals in certain roles will behave. So what assumptions, just think to yourself, come to mind about librarian? Like for me, you know, you think of, I immediately get in my head like from an old kid's cartoon, a uh, woman with big glasses always going shh at you because you're talking too loud. That is my uh, role schema. The uh, assumptions that come to mind to me, at least, about librarian, but it could be very different for going from person to person. So an event schema or a cognitive script are a set of routine or automatic behaviors. So they can vary widely among different cultures and countries. They dictate behavior and they make habits difficult to break. Uh, for example, when riding in an elevator, we automatically stand facing the door. Uh, I've never seen, well, I mean, you have a picture there, but unless it's a really crowded elevator, you're probably going to face the door. It's a cognitive script. So, event schema, continuing on, are difficult to change because they're automatic. When we receive a text, our event schema is to pick up our phone and reply. The problem is, is that this automatic reaction will arise even in situations when it is not safe to reply. Texting while driving is dangerous, but it is a difficult event schema for some people to resist. So research suggests that just the event schema of regularly checking our phone makes it increasingly difficult to resist picking it up while driving. So 
better explanation for event schemas, how they're difficult to change because they just become automatic. Like I have friends who um, will just automatically get a text while they're driving, even though you know it's it's against the law. You could get a wreck, something bad could happen. They'll still hear the phone buzz, be on their phone, they'll be on their phone while driving because they're so hard to resist because it's an automatic response. So continuing on, I know I say that a lot, but it's a good transition phrase, I think. Um, so language. Language is a communication system that involves using words and systematic rules to organize those words to transmit information from one individual to another. So the components of language, you have a lexicon, the words of a given language, grammar, which is a set of rules that are used to convey meaning through the use of the lexicon. We have a phoneme or a basic sound unit like ah or ed, eh, it's a very basic sound unit. Morphemes, which are the smallest unit of what Get all tongue twisted here. Uh, which are the smallest units of language that convey some type of meaning. Language is constructed through schematics and syntax. We have semantics, the meaning we der derive from morphemes and words, and syntax, the way words are organized in the sentences. There's language. Next, we have language development. So, Noam Chomsky proposed that the mechanisms underlying language acquisition are biologically determined. So language developed in the absence of formal instruction. Language acquisition follows similar patterns in children from different cultures slash backgrounds. Now, a critical period is proficiency in acquiring language is maximal early life. Being deprived of language during the critical period impedes the ability to fully acquire and use language. So when you're younger, you acquire language easier. That's why, um, you know, a lot of people who are bilingual, they learn, you know, for example, English and Spanish. Um, through their parents, might have had one parent that speaks English, one parent that speaks Spanish, so they grew up hearing both, so it's much easier for them to learn those two languages and become proficient with them, rather than, for example, me, I have to take Spanish courses, it's much harder for me to get it in my head. So, here we have the case of Genie. So the effects of language deprivation, deprivation during the critical period can be seen in the case study of Genie. Uh, they were found at age 13 after being raised in neglectful and abusive conditions and grew up with virtually no social interaction and was unable to speak when found. So with help, Jeannie was able to acquire vocabulary but was not able to learn the grammatical aspects of language. That's pretty crazy because she missed that critical period. Here we have a nice chart, the stages of language and communication development. So we have seven stages ranging from birth to three to five years. So stage one, it, the development of the language and communication is reflexive communication. Stage two is, again, reflexive communication plus interest in others. So three is intentional communication, so eight to 13 months, and sociability. Uh, 12 to 18 months, we have your first words, you know, mama, dada, so on and so forth. Uh, stage five, we have simple sentences of two words. Now, stage six, two to three years, you have sentences of three or more words, and then by three to five years, complex sentences, and the kid can have conversations with you. You know, talk to a three or five year old, they're going to be able to hold a conversation with you, not just give you one or two word answers. So, problem solving strategies. So, there's trial and error, which is continue trying different solutions until the problem is solved, algorithm, which is a step by step problem solving formula, a heuristic, which is general problems problem solving framework, so you have shortcuts of rule of thumb, working backwards, so we begin solving the problem by focusing on the end result and breaking large tasks into a series of smaller steps. So when do people use heuristics? When one is faced with too much information, when the time to make a decision is limited, when the decision to be made is unimportant, when there is access to very little information to use in the making of the decision, and when an appropriate heuristic happens to come to mind in the same moment. So, going on, again, problem solving strategies. We have method, trial, and error, algorithm, heuristic, and you have your descriptions here. So, trial and error, you continue trying different solutions to problem to solve. An example would be, you know, restarting your phone, turning off Wi Fi, turning off Bluetooth in order to determine why your phone is not functioning. Now, an algorithm is the step-by-step -step problem solving formula, so you use it for instruction manual, for installing new software on your computer, and then finally heuristic, it's just a general problem solving framework, so examples of working backwards, 
you know, breaking a task into steps rather than tackling the whole thing at once. So here we have some puzzles. So number one, we have Sudoku. So problem solving abilities can improve with practice. Many people practice every day with puzzles such as Sudoku. And I will not lie to you, I have no idea what Sudoku is. I know it exists, I just don't know how to do it. Um, so puzzle two, spatial reasoning. So connect all nine dots with four connecting straight lines without lifting your pencil from the paper. So you need to make four straight lines and connect all the dots. So that's using your spatial reasoning. So here we have the answers. You have Sudoku. Yeah, Sudoku, I was thinking of Uno for a second. And then you have your spatial reasoning. Here are the four lines you would draw in order to connect all nine of those dots. So we will end for now but we will definitely uh, be continuing on the next video with pitfalls to problem solving. Uh, I hope you guys found this video enjoyable, maybe at least a little bit, and uh, educational. And I hope you guys have a great day. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sync, the Sync Psychology, and I will hopefully see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye. Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sync, Sync Psychology, and we are going to be continuing going through the OpenStax online 2E textbook. It's kind of a word mouthful. Um, and we are going to try, I don't know if we'll do it in this video, but try and finish up uh, chapter seven. There might be a shorter video uh, to wrap it up. But anyways, so last time we spoke about problem solving strategies, language development, language, Schemat, you know, schematas, uh, what exactly is the cognitive, cognitive psychology. And we left off, right after we looked at the answers to those two kind of problem solving tasks, um, we left off at pitfalls to problem solving. So we have a quote here from Albert Einstein, which is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It's, uh, I really like that quote if you've never heard of it. Um, so. First, we have mental sets, which is persistence in approaching a problem in a way that has worked in the past. So it's a set way of looking at a problem. And it becomes a problem when that way is no longer working. So functional fixedness is inability to perceive an object being used for something other than what it was designed for. So imagine you have a candle, thumbtacks, and a box of matches. You need to mount the candle on the wall and light it. What do you do? So very few people think to use the box as a holder for the candle, which can be tacked to the wall because they are fixated on this normal function. And I'll be honest with you, that's the way I, I wouldn't have gotten that. I would, I would have been like, oh, just stick the thumbtacks through the candle onto the wall, which wouldn't be good, and you're going to light your wall on fire. Um, so next, we have biases. So knowledge and reasoning are used to make decisions. However, sometimes our ability to reason can be swayed by biases. So we have an anchoring bias, which is a tendency to focus on one piece of information when making a decision or solving a problem. Then we have confirmation bias, which is a tendency to focus on information that confirms your existing beliefs. Hindsight bias leads you to believe that the event you just experienced was predictable, even though it wasn't. So, you know, you ever hear the phrase hindsight's 2020? Um, that's when, you know, you do something, you mess up, and you're like, oh, I should have done something else like that, I, I should have realized that would happen, but you couldn't have known, you know, you could, uh, you could always look back on something and be like, oh, this is what I should have done, that's what I should have said, that's why I say hindsight's 2020. Um, next we have representative bias, which is a tendency to unintentionally stereotype someone or something and availability heuristic, so it's a tendency to make a decision based on an example, information, or recent experience that is readily available to you, even though it may not be the best example to inform your decision. So next we have classifying intelligence. What is intelligence? Psychologists have come up with many different ways to define intelligence. So Charles Spearman believed intelligence consisted of one general factor called G. And it focused, focused on commonalities amongst various intellectual abilities. Next we have Raymond Cattell, which divided intelligence into two components. Crystallized intelligence, which is acquired knowledge and the ability to retrieve it, so knowing facts, and fluid intelligence, the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems, so knowing how to do something. So the triarchic theory of intelligence, Robert Sternberg's theory identifies three types of intelligence, practical, creative, and analytical. 
Now, analytical intelligence is an academic problem solving and can be com computation. <laughs> Practical intelligence is street smarts and common sense, and creative intelligence is imaginative and innovative problem solving. So we have multiple intelligences theory, which is Howard Gardner proposed that each person possesses at least eight intelligence. intelligences. Linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, bodily, kinesthetic, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalist. Now, inter- and intrapersonal intelligences are often combined and called emotional intelligence. So, these two are often put together and called emotional. Now, uh, whoops, go back. Now, emotional intelligence is the ability to understand the emotions of yourself and others, show empathy, understand social relationships and cues, and regulate your own emotions and respond in culturally appropriate ways. So creativity is the ability to generate, create, or discover new ideas, solutions, and possibilities. Now creative people usually have intense knowledge about something, work on it for years, look at novel solutions, so like unique solutions, and seek out the advice and help of other experts and take risks. Creativity is often thought of as one's ability to engage in divergent thinking. Now, divergent thinking is thinking outside the box, um, used when more than one possibility exists on the situation. Now, convergent thinking is ability to provide a correct or well-established answer or solution to a problem. So, measures of intelligence. Um, measuring intelligence can come in many forms. A person's intelligence quotient, or IQ, is a score earned on a test designed to measure intelligence. So how do psychologists ensure that tests function as valid measures of intelligence? So we have the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. Now in the early 1900s, Alfred Binet developed an intelligence test to use on children to determine which ones might have difficulty in school. Lewis Terman, a Stanford psychologist, modified Binet's work by standardizing the administration of the test and testing thousands of children to establish a norm. Now, standardization is the manner of administration scoring and an interpretation of results is consistent. Norming is giving a test to a large population so data be can be collected comparing groups, such as age groups. Now, the resulting data provides norms, the resulting data provide norms slash referential scores used to interpret future scores. Standardization and norming ensure that new scores are reliable. So, Alfred Binet, uh, see him right here, very handsome man. Uh, French psychologist Alfred Binet helped to develop intelligence testing. And second figure B, this page is from a 1908 version of the Binet-Simon intelligence scale. Children being tested were asked which face of each pair was prettier. So they look at all these faces of each pair, and each pair they pick the prettier face. So continuing on, the Wechsler, Wechsler? I might be saying that wrong. Um, let me know if I am. Uh, adult Intelligence Scale, or the WACE. So David Weschler's definition of intelligence is the global capacity of the person to act purposely, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his environment. In 1939, Weschler developed a new IQ test by combining several subtests from other intelligence tests. Uh, it tapped into a variety of verbal and nonverbal skills and is one of the most extensively used intelligence tests. Now, Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children, or the WISC-5, yeah, is uh, one of many versions used today that test one, verbal comprehension, two, visual spatial, three, fluid reasoning, four, working memory, and five, processing speed. Now, the Flynn effect is after years of use within schools and communities, periodic recalibration of waste lead to a, led to an observation known as the Flynn effect, and the observation that each generation has a significantly higher IQ than the last. That's the Flynn effect. So here we have a nice bell curve. So results of intelligence tests follow the bell curve. In psychological testing, this graph demonstrates a representative sample slash normal distribution of a trait in the human population. So a representative sample is a subset of the population that accurately represents the general population, and it usually requires a large sample size. So here we have, you know, bell curve of the height of US woman. Uh, so most of them fall between five foot three, five foot six. Um, and then they kind of slope down, you know, not many people are full grown women are 410, not many are above 510. So this is like the, the average. So are you of below average, average or average height, above average? Uh, just let me know if you want to. <laughs> so 
IQ bell curve, the average IQ score is 100. Standard deviations describe how data are dispersed in the population. Now, one standard deviation in IQ testing is 15 points. So a score of 85 is one standard deviation below the mean, or the average. Now, any score between, a one, or between one standard deviation above and below the mean is considered an average. Now, 82% of the population have an IQ score between 85 and 115. So that's 82% of your population right there. So next we have, oh, we only have a few more slides, guys. Let's power through. Um, next we have the source of intelligence. So nature or nurture. Now the nature perspective is intelligence is inherited from a person's parents. So the heritability of intelligence is often researched using twin studies. Now identical twins raised together and identical twins raised apart exhibit a higher correlation between ISQ scores than siblings or fraternal twins raised together. Now, nurture perspective is that intelligence is shaped by a child's de developmental uh, environment. If parents present children with intellectual stimuli, it will be reflected in the child's intelligence level. So most psychologists now believe that levels of intelligence are a combination of both. Now, your range reaction. Theory that each person responds to the environment in a unique way based on his or her genetic makeup. So your genetic makeup is a fixed quantity and whether you reach your full intellectual potential is dependent upon environmental factors. So next we have genetics and IQ. We have another chart here. So the correlations of IQs of unrelated versus related persons where you're apart or together suggest a genetic component to intelligence. So, you know, you can look at this. You have adoptive parent-child pairs. They have no genes shared with similarly aged, unrelated children raised together. Uh, they also have no genes shared with adoptive siblings. And so now here you have a percent IQ correlation. So then 50% or half siblings have 25% genes shared. Uh, parent children pairs and fraternal twins raised together have 50% of their genes shared. And then identical twins raised apart still have 100% of genes shared. Next, we have learning disabilities. So learning disabilities are cognitive disorders that affect different areas of cognition, particularly language or reading. So specific neurological impairments, not an intellectual slash developmental problem. And it often affects children with average to above average intelligence. And they exhibit comorbidity with other disorders. So, for example, we have dysgraphia, a learning disability resulting in a struggle to write legibly. They have difficulty putting their thoughts down on paper. And we have dyslexia, which I'm sure you've heard of before. I think it's like the most pre prevalent one everybody knows about, um, is an inability to correctly process letters is most common learning disability in children and may mix up letters within words and sentences, so letter reversals. So these written words show variations of the word teapot as written by individuals with dyslexia. So, you know, you have teapot, but you can see all the different ways that the letters kind of get around, get arranged, and why that makes reading difficult, you know, because if, you know, I see teapot, you know, but someone with dyslexia will see this and it's like, what is that? What word is that? You know, it's nonsense. So, continuing on. All right, guys. So that was chapter seven from the uh, online OpenStax 2E textbook. Again, my name is Prescott, and this is PsychSync. It's a sync psychology. Uh, and I hope to see you guys all in for chapter eight. We're just going to keep going through this whole course. Uh, please let me know in the comments, you know, how you enjoyed it, if you found it educational, you know, if there's something I need to change about the way I'm presenting, um, I appreciate any and all feedback. So again, my name is Prescott, and I hope you guys have a great day. See you later. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psych Sync, Succinct Psychology. My name is Prescott, and today we are going to start Chapter 8, Memory, from the OpenStack Psychology 2E uh, online textbook. So let's get started with what is memory. So memory is the study of memory looks at some of the following questions. How do we process and store information? Are there different types of memory? How do we retrieve memories? And why do we forget Why we forget things? So photographs can trigger our memories and bring back past experiences back to life. So here you have, you know, a bunch of photographs that somebody took, and if they looked at them, probably be like, oh, I remember this, you know, it triggers your memory. So, how memory functions. Memory is an information processing system like a computer. 
is a set of processes used to encode, store, and retrieve information over different periods of time. So, encoding involves the input of information into the memory system. Storage is the retention of the encoded information, and retrieval is getting the information out of memory and back into the awareness. So, our first step, encoding, is when the brain receives information from the environment, it labels slash codes it, organizes it with other similar information, and connects new concepts to existing concepts. So encoding occurs through two types of processing. Automatic processing, or encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words, and it is usually done without conscious awareness. So for example, remembering when you last studied. Now effortful processing is encoding of de details that takes time and effort. So that would be what you last studied, or learning new skills. So. Yeah, so when you first learn new skills, such as driving a car, you have to put forth effort and attention to encode that information about driving. Now, once you know how to drive, you can encode additional information about the skill automatically without having to really try. Now, there are some types of encoding. We have semantic encoding, which is encoding of words and their meanings. Uh, is the most effective form of encoding. Attaching meaning to information makes it easier to recall later. Now, and it involves a deeper level of processing. Now, visual encoding is the encoding of images, uh, which are words that create a mental image, such as car, dog, and book, concrete words, uh, and are easier to recall than words such as level, truth, and value, or abstract words. We talked about concrete versus abstract in the last chapter. Uh, so, acoustic encoding is the encoding of sounds. Oh, whoops. Now, a self-reference event is a tendency for an individual to have better memory for information that relates to oneself in comparison to material that has less personal relevance. Now, storage, the Delhi and Hitch model. So the Delhi and Hitch proposed a model of storage where short-term memory has different forms depending on the type of information received. So storing memories is like opening different files on a computer and adding in information. So we have three short-term systems. A visio, a visio, visu, visual, I don't know, a spatial sketchpad, episodic buffer, and a phonological loop. So according to the model, a central executive supervises the flow of information between the systems. So here you have your central executive, there's a vi visual spatial sketchpad, episodic buffer, and phonological loop, and they all lead into long-term memory. So the central executive here is what supervises this flow of information. So. Storage, the AS model, or A through S. So storage is the creation of a permanent record of information. Now the atkinson schriffen model of memory is the information passes through these three distinct stages in order for it to be stored in long-term memory. So it's based on the belief that memories are processed the same way that a computer processes information. So you have sensory input, which leads to sensory memory. Uh, information not transferred is lost. And you have sensory memory goes to short-term memory, and that goes to long-term memory, and long-term memory can go back into short-term memory. Uh, short-term memory is rehearsal, so information not transferred is also lost. So, sensory memory is storage of brief sensory events, such as sights, sounds, and tastes. It's stored up, or stored for up to a couple of seconds in the first step of processing stimuli from the environment. If the information is not important, it is discarded, and if the information is valuable, then it moves into our short-term memory. So here we have the Stroop effect. Uh, that's a funny word. Uh, the Stroop effect was discovered while studying sensory memory and describes why it is difficult for us to name a color when the word and the color of the word are different. So here, like, so why is it different? So, you know, the Stroop effect, nice sample here. So, you know, you have the word red, but it's in the color blue. You know, or the word green was in the color blue. Yellow, but it's in the color purple. It's hard for you to process that. So, short-term memory, or STM, uh, is a temporary storage system that processes incoming sensory memory. It lasts about 20 seconds, and capacity is usually about seven items, plus or minus two, uh, as was discovered by George Miller. So, short-term memories are either discarded or stored in long-term memory. Now, memory consolidation is the transfer of short-term memory to long-term memory, and one way memory consolidation can be achieved is through rehearsal. Now, rehearsal is the conscious repetition of information to be remembered. So you need to rehearse. 
Now, long-term memory is the continuous storage of information. It has no limit and is like the information you store on the hard drive of a computer. There are two components of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Now, explicit, here you have a nice chart, so you have long-term memory, which splits into explicit or declarative memory, and implicit or non-declarative. Now, explicit is episodic or experienced events and semantic knowledge, or semantic knowledge and concepts. Now, implicit is procedural skills and actions and emotional conditioning. So those are differences between explicit and implicit. Continuing with that, we have explicit memory. So our explicit memory, or declarative memory, is memories of facts and events we can consciously remember and recall slash declare. Now, explicit memories include two types. Semantic, which is knowledge about words, concepts, and language. So like knowing who the president is. And then you have episodic, so information about events we have personally experienced. So, for example, remembering your fifth birthday party, uh, the what, where, when of an event, also called autobiographical memory. And a small number of people, including actress Mary Lou Henner, have a highly superior autobiographical memory known as hyperthymesia. So next we have implicit memories. So implicit memory is a memory are memories that are not part of our consciousness and they are formed through behaviors. And then procedural uh, it stores information about how to do things. So skills and actions. So for example, how to ride a bike, tie your shoelaces, drive. Now implicit memory also includes behaviors learned through emotional conditioning. So you might have a fear of spiders but not consciously remember why or what occurred to condition that fear. And I know a lot of people are really scared of spiders. Um, next we have retrieval. How do you get information back out of storage? So, retrieval is the act of getting information out of memory storage and back into conscious awareness. So, retrieval is needed for everyday functioning, for example, knowing how to drive to work or how to perform your job once you get there. There are three ways to retrieve information. Recall, which is being able to access information without cues, so used for an essay test. Uh, recognition is being able to identify information that you have previously learned after encountering it again. So it's used for a multiple choice test. And then you have relearning. So learning information that you previously learned. So after learning Spanish in high school, you might forget how to speak it if you do not use it. However, if you try to relearn it, you will learn it quicker than the first time. That's actually exactly what happened to me. I took some Spanish in high school and middle school. I learned a bit, uh, stopped taking it after my freshman year of high school. And then I got to college and I forgot a lot of it, but it was easier for me to remember, to learn uh, than it was the first time in high school. So, parts of the brain involved in memory. So, Carl Lashley and engrams. Carl Lashley, Lashley was looking for evidence of an engram, the group of neurons that serve as the physical representation of memory. Uh, he studied parts of the brain involved in memory by making lesions in the brains of animals, such as rats and monkeys. And he trained the rats to learn their way around a maze and then made lesions to try to remove the memory. Lashley was unable to find evidence of an engram. The rats were still able to remember their way around the maze, so he formulated a new hypothesis, which was the equipotentiality hypothesis. It's a mouthful. Um, if part of one area of the brain involved in memory is damaged, another part of the same area can take over that memory function, which would explain why even though he made lesions in the rats' brains, they were still able to find their way around the maze. Now, Eric Candle studied the synapse and its role in controlling the flow of information through neural circuits needed to store memories. So, here we have parts of the brain involved in memory. So, scientists have now identified different parts of the brain involved in memory. So, you have the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the cerebellum. These are all involved in memory. So, going further into detail about that, uh, well, I think that's a good, sp good stop stopping point. Um, for today's video, but we will continue from right here, parts of the brain involved in memory, uh, in the next part. So, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sync, the Sync Psychology, and yeah, hope you guys have a great day and hope to see you in the next video. Take care. Hello everybody, welcome back. My name is Prescott, I'm here at PsychSync, Succinct Psychology, and today we're going to continue where we left off from chapter eight of the online OpenStax 2E Psychology textbook. Uh, this chapter we're doing now is memory. So 
we are going to continue, like I just said, um, and we're going to start off, if you guys remember from the last video, uh, we identified the different parts of the brain involved in memory. So you have the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, hippocampus, and the cerebellum, but we're going to go further into detail about those parts. So first off, we have the amygdala, and this is, we've talked about these parts before. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head which unit that was. It was one of the earlier ones. So this will be kind of, you know, funny. We were talking about how if you uh, learn something, you know, in the past, and then you kind of forget about it, and then you go back later to relearn it, you'll remember it better. It'll be easier for you than it was the first time. So we're kind of doing that right now. So anyways, the amygdala is involved in fear and fear memories. So memory storage is influenced by stress hormones and processes emotional information important in encoding memories at a deeper level in memory consolidation. Now, the hippocampus is associated with explicit memory, recognition memory, and spatial memory. It projects information to cortical regions that give memories meaning and connect them with other memories, and it is involved in memory consolidation. Now, damage leads to an inability to process new declarative memories. So, I don't know if you guys remember, but I brought up an easy way to remember the, these two parts. Um, Roll, amygdala, I think of it. There's a character in this video game I played. It was this big, ugly, spider-like monster, uh, which is freaky, so amygdala, fear, and fear memories. And then hippocampus is involved in memory consolidation. Um, you know, if you saw a bunch of hippos on your campus, you would, you would remember that. You know, you'd be like, why are there hippos here? So, Continuing on, we have the cerebellum, which plays a role in processing procedural memories, such as how to play the piano and classical conditioning. Now, damage prevents classical conditioning, such as an IA blink, in response to a puff of air. Now, the prefrontal cortex appears to be involved in remembering semantic tasks. Now, PET scans show activation in the left inferior prefrontal cortex when completing semantic tasks. Encoding is associated with left frontal activity, and retrieval of information is associated with the right frontal region. Moving on, we have neurotransmitters. So communication among neurons via neurotransmitters is critical for developing new memories. Now, repeated neuron activity leads to increased neurotransmitters in the synapse, which leads to stronger synaptic connections. This is how memory consolidation occurs. Now, neurotransmitters involved in memory include epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and acetylcholine, and we have also, if I'm remembering correctly, have spoken about these neurotransmitters. Um, so uh, now the arousal theory is that strong emotions trigger the formation of strong memories and weaker emotional experiences form weaker memories. So strong emotional experiences can trigger the release of neurotransmitters which strengthen the memory, uh, evidenced by flashbulb memories, an exceptionally clear recollection of an important emotional event. So, flashbulb memory. A record of an atypical and unusual event has very strong emotional associations. So, depending on the age and awareness slash interest of the person, certain flashbulb memories can act as a generational reference points. Examples include the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, or Robert Kennedy, you know, the first humans landing on the moon, and the attacks of 9-11. Now, flashbulb memory formation may depend on cultural reference and personal investment slash involvement. So, for example, a national leader suddenly resigning may become a flashbulb memory for those citizens only, and an athlete suddenly retiring may become a flashbulb memory for fans of that sport or team. So 9-11 is the most recent flashbulb memory that has been extensively researched. Next, we have amnesia, which is the loss of long-term memory that occurs as the result of disease, physical trauma, or psychological trauma. There are two common types, anterograde amnesia, which is the inability to remember new information after point of trauma. It's common, commonly caused by brain trauma, and the hippocampus is usually affected, which causes inability to transfer information from the short-term memory to long-term, excuse me, long-term memory. Now, retrograde amnesia is a loss of memory, partial or complete, for events that occurred prior to the drama. So, antro after, retro prior. And here you have retrograde, you lose your memory of events that occurred prior to the event. Antrograde is the inability to remember new stuff. So if you had a traumatic event, you had antrograde amnesia, you would have an inability to retain new information. Next, we have memory construction and reconstruction. So construction is a formulation of new memories, while reconstruction is the process of bringing up old memories. 
So when we retrieve memories, we tend to unintentionally alter and modify them, resulting in inaccuracies and distortions. So suggestibility. Suggestibility is the effect of misinformation the effects of misinformation from external sources that leads to the creation of false memories. It can cause people to claim to remember something that was only a suggestion someone made. Uh, memories are fragile, making them vulnerable to the power of suggestion. And an important area of study has been the role of suggestibility in eyewitness testimonies. So, eyewitness misidentification. Eyewitness identification and testimony is often used in the persecution of criminals. Now, research suggests that suggestive police identification procedures can lead to alterations in an eyewitness's memory leading to misidentification. So here we have a chart, leading cause of wrongful conviction in DNA exoneration cases. Here on the Y, you have percentage of wrongful convictions. So the first 239 DNA uh, exonerations, and then you have the leading causes. So uh, you can see eyewitness misidentification is responsible for like 75%. Uh, whereas forensic science is just under 50, false confession just over 20, and informant is right under 20. So in studying cases where DNA evidence has exonerated people from crimes, the Innocence Project discovered that eyewitness misidentification is the leading cause of wrongful convictions, which obviously you don't want wrongful convictions. It's not good for anybody. So the misinformation effect. So Elizabeth Loftus studied false memories. Now, misinformation effect paradigm is after exposure to incorrect information, a person may misremember the original event. So there was a study done in 1974 which asked college students to estimate the speed of cars using different forms of questions. Now, participants were shown films of car accidents and were asked to play the role of eyewitnesses and describe what happened. So they were asked about how fast were the cars going when they, you know, crashed each other. Participants that heard the word smashed, well, they used all these different words, but uh, participants that heard the word smashed estimated that the cars were traveling a lot faster than those that heard the word con contacted. If they heard the word glass, they were more than twice as likely to say they remember seeing glass, which is a false memory. And then the implied meaning of the word used influenced the participant's memory of the accident. So just using the word smashed influenced their memory of it. So, Loftus study. When people are asked leading questions about an event, their memory of the event may be altered. As we can see here, um, the perceived speed was much higher when they used words like smashed, collided, and then when it got to like bumped and hit and contacted, their memory of the event, you know, the perceived speed was much lower. So, oh, whoops, that was weird. We had a little glitch there. Sorry about that, everybody. All right, so next we have repressed and recovered memories. So a controversial topic within psychology is the idea that whole events can be repressed or falsely recalled. Now, false memory syndrome is the recall of false autobiographical memories. Now, repressed memories, uh, some psychologists believe it is possible to completely repress traumatic childhood memories such as sexual abuse. Uh, this can lead to psychological distress in adulthood, uh, and some believe that these can be recalled through hypnosis and guided imagery techniques. Now, Loftus challenges the idea of repressed memories and questions if recalled memories are accurate or whether the process of questioning and suggestibility leads to the misinformation effect. So, how can suggestibility be avoided when questioning eyewitnesses? little question you can think to yourself, and if you want to, leave a comment. Uh, we can have a little discussion about it. So, why do we forget? Now, forgetting... Oops is a loss of information from long-term memory. Now, this is encoding failure occurs when the memory is never stored in our memory in the first place. So successful encoding requires effort and attention. So can you tell which coin is the accurate depiction of a U.S. nickel? Most Americans cannot tell which one because we do not encode the specific details. We just know enough to di differentiate it from other coins. And I'll tell you right now, I couldn't tell you with 100% certainty uh, which coin is the correct depiction of the U.S. nickel, all I know is the size of it and color, so I know it's a nickel. Now, memory errors. Uh, so you have Schachter's seven sins of memory. You have forgetting type, which are one, transients, the accessibility of memory decreases over time, or storage decay. Then you have absent-mindedness, which is forgetting caused by lapses in attention, and blocking, which is the accessibility of information is temporarily blocked, aka tip-of-the-tongue phenomenon. 
So when you're like, oh, I was going to say something, what was I going to say? If you say, I was on the tip of my tongue, you, you just blinked out. Now, we have the distortion type. So misattribution, which is a source of memory, is confused. And suggestibility, which is false memories. And then we have bias, which is memories distorted by current belief system. And then finally, you have the intrusion type, which is persistence, the inability to forget undesirable memories. Continuing on, we have transience slash storage decay. Over time, unused information tends to fade away. So we have Ebbinghaus, 1885, studied the process of memorization. The Ebbinghaus forgetting curve shows how quickly memory for new information decays. So it decays 50% after just 20 minutes and 70% after 24 hours. So here we have a nice chart for better representation. It shows the elapsed time since learning. So you can see 50% was gone after just 20 minutes. So, bias. According to Schachter, oh, sorry. your feelings and view of the world could distort your memory of past events. So, stereotypical bias involves racial and gender biases. After presenting people with a list of names, they more frequently incorrectly remember typical African-American names to be associated with the occupation basketball player, and typical white names to be associated with the occupation politician. Now, egocentric bias involves enhancing our memories of the past. So, people remember events in a way that make them look better. Then hindsight bias, the tendency to think an outcome, and we talked about this in the last chapter, um, tendency to think an outcome is inevitable after the fact. So thinking you knew it all along. Then we have persistence. Many veterans of military conflicts involuntarily recall unwanted, unpleasant memories. So, you know, combat, something along those lines. And we have interference. So proactive interference, old information hinders recall of new information. Retroactive interference, new information hinders recall of old information. So next, sorry if I'm going a little fast, but I just want to finish up this unit. So, because we don't have many more slides to go, uh, it would be kind of wasteful, I think, to make a whole new video. So anyways, ways to enhance memory. Rehearsal, which is a conscious repetition of information to be remembered, and chunking, which is organizing information into manageable bits or chunks. So, for example, separating phone numbers into three chunks. Then you have elaborative rehearsal, which is a technique in which you think about the meaning of the new information and its relation to knowledge already stored in your memory. Now, mnemonic devices are memory aids that help us organize information for encoding. So, for example, one way to remember the order of the planets is the name M, R, V, M, J, Sun. Other, other techniques can include expressive writing and saying words aloud. Next, we have mnemonic devices. So, this is a knuckle mnemonic to help you remember the number of days in each month. Months with 31 days are represented by the protruding knuckles, and shorter months fall in the spots between knuckles. So, you know, starting in January, your knuckle is protruding, so that's a 31-day month, and then the next February is not protruding, so it's less than 31. It's a handy little mnemonic to remember how many days are in a month. And finally, how to study effectively. So memory techniques can be useful when studying for class. So use elaborative rehearsal, link information to other information and memories to make it more meaningful. And apply, step two is to Apply the self-reference effect. Make information personally meaningful to you. Three, you have don't forget the forgetting curve. Keep studying to prevent storage decay. Step four is rehearse. Just keep studying, get it drilled into your head. Five, you have be aware of interference. So study without distractions. So, you know, be on your phone or listening to really loud music. Um, six, keep moving. Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis, which is the growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus. So, you know, maybe go for a walk before you study. Seven, we have get enough sleep. So you need to, obviously, sleep is good. Uh, the brain consolidates memories. It keeps them while you're sleeping. And finally, make use of those mnemonic devices. So, for example, the knuckle thing with the months. You can come with your own mnemonics in order to help you study and retain the information. Well, guys, that's all for this chapter, Chapter 8, Memory. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed and found it, you know, helpful, educational. Uh, sorry this video was a bit longer, but I just kind of wanted to wrap everything up in a nice little video. So, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at PsychSync, so Sync Psychology. 
I hope you guys have a great day and you know please leave a comment in the video if you have any questions or you know any advice or tips or tricks to how we can make these videos better for you guys uh, please let me know but other than that have a great day thanks Hello everybody, welcome back. My name is Prescott and I'm here at PsychSync, Succinct Psychology. And today we are going to start chapter nine, lifespan development. Sorry, I had a long slide there. Um, from the OpenStax Psychology 2E online textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So lifespan, lifespan development studies, how you change as well as how you remain the same over the course of your life. So what is lifespan development? Developmental psychologists study lifelong development across three domains. Physical development, so growth and changes in the body and brain, senses, motor skills, and health and wellness. And you have cognitive development, which is learning, attention, memory, language, thinking, reasoning, and creativity. And then psychosocial development, which are emotions, personality, and social relationships. So, normative approach. What is normal development? Normative psychologists have studied large numbers of children to determine norms, or average ages, of when most children reach specific developmental milestones. Uh, for example, crawling, walking, speaking in sentences, starting puberty. Then you have biological milestones, such as starting puberty, are universal. You know, everybody goes through puberty. And social milestones, such as starting school, vary across cultures. It's not all the same. So, continuous versus discontinuous. Discontinuous development. Developmental psychologists have different views on the processes of lifespan development. So continuous development views development as a cumulative process, gradually improving on existing skills. For example, adding inches to height each year. Now discontinuous development views development as occurring in unique stages, so specific times or ages. So here you have continuous development from infancy to adulthood. Discontinuous development is infancy, you know, to adulthood, but you see it's not a straight line, it's not steady slope, it goes a little variable. So, is there one course of development or many? Is development universal for all children or is it individual depending on each child's genetics and environment? So stage theories believe that the process of development is universal. So, evidence for one course. Studies show that children from all around the world reach language milestones in a similar sequence. And then evidence for many courses Cultural differences in child care practices, different practices can accelerate or inhibit achievement of developmental milestones. So, here we have all children across the world love to play. Whether in Florida, seen here, or South Africa, seen here. Children enjoy exploring sand, sunshine, and the sea. That's universal. Next, we have the nature versus nurture. Good old nature versus nurture debate. So, of course, nature is biology and genetics, and then nurture is environment and culture. So, the nature versus nurture debate considers how our personalities and traits are the result of our genetics and biological factors and how they're shaped by our environment. So, why are siblings sometimes so different? Are adopted children more like bi their biological or adopted parents? And is intelligence inherited? Is it shaped by our learning experiences or is it a combination of both? These questions can be answered by looking at the interaction between both nature and nurture, usually in twin and adoption studies. Both nature and nurture are important in development, but psychologists debate the relative contributions of each. So here we have theories of development. You have the psychosexual theory, psychosocial, cognitive, and the theory of moral development. So going on, the psychosexual theory, which is Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud believed that childhood experiences shape our personalities and behaviors as adults. It was viewed it, uh, he viewed development as discontinuous and developed stages of psychosexual development. Uh, Freud believed lack of proper nurturance and parenting during a stage could lead to a child becoming stuck slash fixated in that stage. And he claimed that children's pleasure-seeking urges are focused on different erogenous zones at each of the five stages of development. So, you have oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. Continuing on, we have the psychosocial theory, Erickson. So Eric Erickson emphasizes the social nature of development, and he argues that personality development takes place across the lifespan, not just in childhood, and based on his belief that social interactions affect our sense of self, so ego identity. 
In each stage of Erickson's theory, there's a psychosocial task that we must master in order to feel a sense of competence. And there are eight stages total. So here are those eight stages of Erickson's psychosocial psycho stages of development. So first stage is trust versus mistrust, which is zero to one years. Um, trust or mistrust that basic needs, such as nourishment and affection, will be met. Stage two is autonomy versus shame slash doubt, which is one to three years, and develop a sense of independence in many tasks. Three is initiative versus guilt. Three to six years takes initiative on some activities and may develop guilt when unsuccessful or boundaries are overstepped. Four, we have industry versus inferiority. Seven to 11 years, yeah, seven to 11, um, develop self-confidence and abilities when competent or sense of inferiority when not. Five, we have identity versus confusion, so 12 to 18 years, and experiment with and develop identity and roles. Six is intimacy versus isolation, 19 to 29 years, establish intimacy and relationship with others. Seven, generativity versus stagnation, 30 to 64 years, so contribute to society and be part of a family. And finally, we have eight, integrity versus despair, 65 plus assesses and makes sense of life and meaning of contributions. So, going on, we have the cognitive theory by Piege. Piege, I can never say his name right. Um, Piege, uh, he focused on children's cognitive growth and theorized that cognitive abilities develop through specific stages. Piege uh, believed children develop schemata or concepts used to categorize and interpret information to help them understand the world. When children learn new information, they adjust their schemata through assimilation and accommodation. Now, assimilation incorporates information into existing schemata, while accommodation changes schemata based on that new information. So assimilation, you're incorporating that information, and accommodation, you're changing your schemata based on the new information you received. So here we have Piaget's stages of cognitive development. So age zero to two, it's the sensory motor stage and it is the world experienced through senses and actions. Now there are some develop developmental issues for each of these stages. So object permanence, understanding that even if something's out of sight, it still exists, and stranger anxiety. So you know, your zero to two year old has trouble, that's why you give you peekaboo, they have no object permanence. They, once they can't see your face, they assume it's gone. So, state, or second stage, age two to six, we have the pre-operational stage, uh, you use words and images to represent things, but lack logical reasoning. Now, developmental issues include pretend play, egocentrism, which is unable to take the perspective of others, they can only view from their point of view, and language development. Stage three, we have age seven to 11, uh, this concrete operational stage, and you understand concrete events and analogies logically, and you perform arithmetical operations. Now, um, issues are, you know, conversation and mathematical transformations. And finally, we have the formal operational stage at age 12 and up. Uh, it's formal operations. You can utilize abstract thinking. And some issues include abstract logic and moral reasoning. Now, we have the theory of moral reasoning here. So, Lawrence Kohlberg identified three stages of moral development, which is learning to discern right from wrong. So, at level one, you have your pre-conventional morality, it has two stages. So stage one, obedience and punishment, behavior driven by avoiding punishment. And stage two is individual interest, behavior driven by self-interest and rewards. Level two is conventional morality. We have stage three, which is interpersonal, behavior driven by social approval, and authority, behavior driven by obeying authority and conforming to social order. And then we have level three, which is stage five and six. Social contract, behavior driven by balance of social order and individual rights. And stage six is universal ethics, behavior driven by internal moral principles. So, Kohlberg identified three levels of moral reasoning, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, each level associated with increasingly complex stages of moral development, as we just went through. Next, we have the stages of development, and we will actually go through that in the next video. Um, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sinks, the Sync Psychology, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video and found it at least a little entertaining and educational. And I will see you next time. Have a good one. Bye.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Psych Sync. My name is Prescott, and here again, Psych Sync, the Sync Psychology. And today we're going to continue going through chapter nine, uh, development. Last time we spoke about some different theory, like the cognitive theory, psychosocial, psychosexual, uh, whether or not development is continuous or discontinuous. So we're going to continue where we left off. We left off on stages of development. So you have prenatal stage, infancy to childhood, adolescence, emerging adulthood, and adulthood. So let's start off with prenatal development. So in prenatal development, you have the germinal stage, which is at least one to two. And conception occurs when sperm fertilizes an egg and forms a zygote, or a one cell structure. Now mitosis is a process of cell division. The zygote divides and cells become more specialized, forming organs and body parts. Now the embryonic stage, is weeks three through eight. After the zygote has 150 cells, it travels down the fallopian tubes and implants itself in the lining of the uterus. The zygote is now an embryo or a multicellular organism, and organs begin to function, so heart begins to beat, and basic structures develop that will become the head, chest, and abdomen. Now, the placenta is a structure connected to the uterus that provides nourishment and oxygen from the mother to the embryo via the umbilical cord. So if you guys were wondering, you know, how do babies breathe, now you know. Now, prenatal development, the fetal stage is weeks nine through 40. During the fetal stage, the baby's brain develops and the body adds size and weight until the fetus reaches full term development. So here you start at nine weeks, then it begins and you get to 40 weeks, full term development. You have a whole baby now. Now, prenatal influences. Genetic and environmental factors can affect development during each prenatal stage. It is important for the mother to receive prenatal care or medical care during pregnancy to monitor the health of the mother and fetus. Now, teratogen, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, is any environmental agent, biological, chemical, or physical, that causes damage to the developing embryo or fetus. Now, alcohol can cause fetal alcohol syndrome. Smoking can result in premature birth, low birth weight, stillbirths, sudden and sudden infant death syndrome. Of drugs like heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, as well as prescription drugs, and then there's radiation, viruses, example HIV, herpes, rubella. So these are all prenatal influences. So we have here fetal alcohol syndrome it is a collection of birth defects associated with heavy consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. Research has found alcohol to be the leading preventable cause of mental retardation in children in the U.S. So, physical effects, small head size, abnormal facial features, so see low nasal bridge, small eye openings, short nose, thin upper lip, underdeveloped jaw, smooth philtrum, flat mid face, epic chantal folds. So, this is uh, fetal alcohol syndrome from YouTube. Now, so again, those are the physical side effects. Now, cognitive could be poor judgment, poor impulse control, higher rates of ADHD learning issues, and lower IQ scores. So, newborns. Newborn reflexes include our inborn automatic responses to particular forms of stimulation, and they help the newborn survive. Now, a rooting reflex is the baby turns its head towards something that touches its cheek. So if you ever touch a baby's cheek, it'll turn its head towards that. Sucking reflex is when they suck on objects placed in the mouth. Grasping reflex, cling to objects placed in hands, and moro reflex, baby spreads arms and pulls them back in when they are startled slash feel like they are falling. Sensory abilities, not yet fully developed at birth. Vision is the least developed sense, so they can't see too good. They prefer human voices, specifically their mothers over strangers, and can distinguish between the smell of their mother and others. Now, physical development and growth occurs rapidly during infancy but it slows down at around ages four to six. Girls have a growth spurt at age eight to nine to about 12. Now, nervous system, the blooming period. Neural pathways form thousands of new connections during infancy and toddlerhood. In the pruning period, is neural connections are reduced during childhood and adolescence to allow the brain to function more efficiently. So the size of the brain increases rapidly, especially the frontal lobe during ages three to six. And 55% of adults size at age two, 90%, wait, 55% of adult size at age two, 90% of adult size at age six, I'm sorry, I tripped myself up there. It's saying that 
They are 55% of adult size at age two, and they are 90 at age six. Now, motor development is motor skills ability, our ability to move our bodies and manipulate objects that occurs in an orderly sequence and becomes more advanced. Now, fine motor skills focus on the muscles in our fingers, toes, and eyes and enable coordination of small actions, for example, gripping a pencil. Now, gross motor skills focus on large muscle groups that control arms and legs and involve larger movements, for example, bouncing and running. Going on, we have cognitive development. So Piaget thought that children's ability to understand objects develops slowly as a child matures and interacts with the environment. Today, developmental psychologists think Piaget was incorrect. Now, Bylar, Bylar, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that right now, uh, 1987. Very young children understand objects and how they work long before they have experience with those objects. In Bylar Gion's study, infants observe a truck roll down an unobstructed track. So, figure A, and then figure B, roll down an unobstructed track with an obstruction box behind it, and C, roll down and pass through what appears to be an obstruction. Infants spent more time looking at C, suggesting that they knew solid objects cannot pass through each other. So that's by large on. It's not like an alien name. Now, cognitive development. There are cognitive milestones. So, at six to nine months, they can shake their head no. Nine to 12, respond to verbal requests. For example, wave bye-bye. Uh, eight months, they understand object permanence. So again, I think I said that in the last video, but children before this don't have object permanence. If you put something under, you hide something. You know, like you have a toy or something, and you put it around the corner, or hide it with a blanket, baby's going to assume that that thing no longer exists. You blinked out of existence. Um, and then toddlers, they understand someone will come back when they leave the room and will look in appropriate places when asked to find objects. So kind of like what I just said. Uh, three to five years, they learn to count, name colors, know their name and age, can make small decisions, understand basic time concepts and sequencing, and enjoy pretend play. And they can think, because they can think symbolically. And they become more curious. They always ask why, and they develop theory in mind. If you've ever had a conversation with a three to five year old, you will know, like, they'll ask you something. They'll be like, oh, well, because of this, why? Well, because of this, why? And it just gets to the point where you question your own existence because they just ask you, well, like, why are you anything? Um, so six to 11, thinking becomes more logical and organized. They understand past, present, and future, and can plan and work towards goals, understand cause and effect relationships, and basic math skills. And their attention span is limited until approximately age 11. So, because they understand luck and fairness, children in middle and late childhood, ages 6 to 11 years old, are able to follow rules for games. So, football, basketball, baseball. Now, psychosocial development, attachment. So, psychosocial development occurs as children form relationships, interact with others, and understand and manage their feelings. Now, attachment is a long-standing connection or bond with others. Uh, forming health attachments is one of the main psychosocial milestones of infancy. So how do parent and infant attachment bonds form? How does neglect affect these bonds? What accounts for children's attachment differences? And the most influential studies conducted to answer these questions were by Harry Harlow, John Bowlby, and Mary Ainsworth. So mutually, here we have a nice picture. Mutually enjoyable interactions promote the mother-infant bond. Well, that's, I don't think that's that kid's mother, but you get the idea. Um, so attachment. Harlow separated newborn monkeys from their mothers and presented them with two surrogate mothers. Uh, one made out of wire and mesh and could dispense milk. One made from cloth did not dispense milk. Monkeys spent time clinging to the cloth monkey and only went to the wire monkey for food. Results suggest that feelings of comfort and security are the critical components to maternal infant bonding. Going on with attachment, we have Bowlby, his attachment theory, uh, define attachment as the affectional bond slash tie that an infant forms with the mother, and the bond must be made with primary caregiver in order to have a normal social and emotional development. Saw attachment as an all or nothing process. You're either attached or you're not. Now, secure base is the parental presence that gives the child a sense of safety as he explores the surroundings, and requirements for a healthy attachment are, one, caregiver must be responsive to the child's social, well, the social, psycho, physical, I'm reading his cycle, 
physical and emotional needs, and the caregiver and child must engage in mutually enjoyable interactions. And then we have Mary Ainsworth in 1970, do children differ in the way they bond, and if so, why? Ainsworth looked to answer this question through a procedure known as the strange situation. Now, strange situation is when a mother, caregiver, you know, the caregiver, and infant are placed in a room together with toys. Stranger enters the room and mother leaves. After a few minutes, mother returns to the room to comfort the child. Through the strange situation, Ainsworth identified three styles of attachment. A fourth was later identified. So you have secure attachment, avoidant, resistant, and disorganized. So that is where we will stop the video today. Um, we will go through the different types of attachment that Ainsworth discovered in the next video. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sinks, the Sink Psychology, and I hope you found the video enjoyable and learned something today, and I will see you in the next video. Have a good day.